This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2021. Lesson three from the series Rest in Christ is titled Roots of Restlessness, ready for teaching on July 17, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 10. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again as your word speaks to us, as we open your word, as your Holy Spirit guides us, as we look at your word, we pray that we will not just understand, but that we may catch a glimpse of who you are, of your glory and your grace and your care for each of us. May we know that you are always there for us, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is James chapter 3 and verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Let's read that again, James 3.16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Aspens are beautiful trees, reaching 45 to 90 feet, that's 15 to 30 metres in height. They thrive in cold climates with cool summers. Their wood is used in furniture and also for making matches and paper. Deer and other animals often feed on young aspen trees during hard winters, as their bark contains many nutrients. Aspens need lots of sunshine, and they grow all the time, even in winter, making them important winter food sources for different animals. Aspens, however, are most notorious for the fact that they have one of the largest root systems in the plant world. The roots spread by underground suckers and form a colony that can spread relatively quickly, covering large areas. Individual aspen trees can live up to 150 years, but the larger organism below the ground can live for thousands of years. In this week's study, we want to discover some of the roots of our restlessness. There are many things that can prevent us from finding true rest in Jesus. Some of these are obvious and don't require much attention. Others can be less obvious to us, and, as with the huge aspen organism unseen beneath the ground, we may not always be conscious of the attitudes and actions that separate us from our Saviour. Sunday, July 11. Jesus brings division. Very few people enjoy conflict. We crave harmony and peace. We even teach seminars on peacemaking and conflict resolution in our churches or institutions. Question, read Matthew 10, 34-39. What does Jesus mean when he says that he did not come to bring peace but to bring a sword? What does this mean, considering that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, as expressed in Isaiah 9 and verse 6? We'll read Isaiah 9 and verse 6 first. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And now Matthew 10, beginning at verse 34. Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus' statement in Matthew 10 verses 34 to 39 is shockingly counterintuitive. The Saviour, who came as a helpless babe instead of a powerful king surrounded by elite bodyguards, who preached love to both neighbours and enemies, now tells his followers that he brings division and struggles. His disciples and his audience may have wondered 
as we are wondering, how can this be? Matthew 10, 35-39 is really about allegiances and loyalties. Quoting Micah 7, 6, Jesus challenges his audience to make choices for eternity. A son should love and honour his parents. That was a legal requirement of the law that Moses had received on the mountain. It was part of God's required mode of operation, and yet, if that love would trump the hearer's commitment to Jesus, it required a tough decision. A father and a mother should love and care for their children. Yet, if that love would top the parent's commitment to Jesus, it required a difficult decision. First things first, Jesus reminds us in this passage. Micah 7 verse 6 reads, For son dishonours father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own household. Jesus expresses this choice by formulating three sentences, each using the term worthy. Worthiness is not based on high moral standards or even overcoming sin. Worthiness is based on one's relationship with Jesus. We are worthy when we choose him above everything else, including mother, father or children. We choose the suffering of the cross and follow Jesus. In the book Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 87, we read, I have no higher wish than to see our youth imbued with that spirit of pure religion which will lead them to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Go forth, young disciples of Christ, controlled by principle, clad in the robes of purity and righteousness. Your Saviour will guide you into the position best suited to your talents and where you can be most useful. And so to finish the day, sometimes we are forced to bear a cross not of our own choosing, and sometimes we voluntarily bear a cross. Either way, what is the key to bearing that cross faithfully? Monday, July 12, Selfishness As in the case of the Aspen and its larger underground system, selfishness is part of the huge underground system called sin, which keeps us from finding true rest in Jesus. Of all the expressions of sin in our lives, selfishness seems to be the easiest to manifest, doesn't it? For most of us, selfishness is as natural as breathing. Question, read Luke 12, verses 13 to 21. Describe the problem highlighted in Jesus' parable. Is planning for the future selfish and expressing disregard for God's kingdom? If not, or at least not necessarily, then what is Jesus warning us against? Luke 12, beginning at verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This parable appears only in the Gospel of Luke and is told in response to an anonymous question from the audience. Asked about a question regarding an inheritance, Jesus responds by rejecting the role of the arbiter between brothers. Instead, he opts to put his finger on the bigger 
underlying problem, namely selfishness. He digs deeper to show the root mass underneath our individual actions. Think about expressions of selfishness in your life. How does selfishness affect our relationships with God, with our spouses and families, with our church families, with our neighbours and with colleagues at work? What key is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. By focusing solely on his own needs and ambitions, the anonymous rich man of Jesus' parable forgot to take into consideration unseen heavenly realities. Bigger, better and more are not the foundational principles of God's kingdom. Paul offers us a glimpse into what motivated Jesus as he decided to become our substitute. Philippians 2, 5-8 describes the blueprint of unselfishness, humility and love. If love for God and others does not drive our choices and priorities, we will continue to build more barns for ourselves here and put less treasure in heaven, as it says in Matthew 6.20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And so to finish today, why is it so easy to get caught up in the desire for wealth and material possessions? Though we all need a certain amount of money to survive, why does it seem to be that no matter how much we have, we always want more? Tuesday, July 13, Ambition Studying the last week of Jesus' ministry on earth prior to his crucifixion is always a source of encouragement and inspiration. It also offers a snapshot of how restlessness and ambition drive people to do and say ill-advised things. Question, read Luke 22, verses 14 to 30, and think about Jesus' emotions as he hears his disciples argue during this solemn meal over who among them should be considered the greatest. In verse 24, why did the disciples get sidetracked from this momentous occasion and focus on human greatness? Luke 22, beginning at verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But Behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? 
yet I am among you as the one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. We seldom discuss with others who is the greatest in our church or family or our workplace. We may think about it a lot, but who really openly talks about it? This was not the first time that this question was raised in the community of Jesus' followers. Matthew 18.1 reports the disciples bringing the question to Jesus and framing it in a more abstract way. Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus' answer involved an object lesson. After calling a child, he sets the child in the centre of the group. Eyes are opened wide, eyebrows are raised. Jesus' action requires an explanation, and in Matthew 18.3, the Master offers that too. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Conversion is foundational for finding true rest in Jesus. We recognise that we need outside help. We suddenly realise that we cannot depend on ourselves, but need to rely on Jesus. We experience a transformation of our values and ambitions. Jesus tells his disciples, Trust me and rely on me as this child does. True greatness is giving up your rights and embracing kingdom values. Unfortunately, it seems that the disciples had not yet learned this lesson by the time Jesus ate the Last Supper with them. Their bickering and infighting ruined a moment of perfect communion that was never to be repeated. All this, even after years of being with Jesus, ministering with Jesus, and hearing and learning at his feet, what a sad example of just how corrupt the human heart remains. On the more positive side, however, think about the ever-present reality of the Lord's grace that despite this pathetic discussion among his followers, Jesus didn't give up on them. And so, to finish today, why should keeping our focus on Jesus on the cross be a powerful remedy against the desire for self-exaltation, which, as fallen human beings, all of us are subject to? Wednesday, July 14. Hypocrisy. A hypocrite is someone who play-acts, who wants to appear to be somebody he or she is not. The term is used seven times in Matthew 23 in a discourse in which Jesus publicly shames the scribes and Pharisees, the very centre of Jewish religious leadership. We see this in Matthew 23 verses 13 to 15, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. And verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. And verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. And verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. And verse 29, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments 
of the righteous. The Gospels show us Jesus offering grace and forgiveness to adulterers, tax collectors, prostitutes and even murderers. But he demonstrated a little tolerance for hypocrites. See the many references in Matthew 6, verse 2, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And verse 5, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And Matthew 7, verse 5, Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And Matthew fifteen seven to 9 Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And Matthew 22, verse 18, But Jesus perceived their wickedness, and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Question. Read Matthew 23, verses 1 to 13, and list four main characteristics of a hypocrite mentioned by Jesus. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad, and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you... Do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Jesus associates four characteristics with the scribes and Pharisees. In the spectrum of Judaism in the first century AD, the Pharisees represented the conservative religious right. They were interested in the written and oral law and emphasised ritual purity. On the other side of the spectrum were the Sadducees, a group of mostly wealthy leaders, often associated with the elite priestly class. They were highly Hellenized, that is, they spoke Greek and were at home in Greek philosophy, and did not believe in a judgment or an afterlife. We would describe them as liberals. Both groups were guilty of hypocrisy. According to Jesus, we are hypocrites if we don't do what we say when we make religion harder for others without applying the same standards to ourselves, when we want others to applaud our religious fervour, and when we require honour and recognition that belongs only to our Heavenly Father. No matter how sharp and to the point his words, Jesus' engagement with those he called hypocrites was nevertheless full of love and concern even for these hypocrites, as we read in Desire of Ages, page 620. Divine pity marked the countenance of the Son of God as he cast one lingering look upon the temple and then upon his hearers. In a voice choked by deep anguish of heart and bitter tears, he exclaimed, O 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent upon thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. And so to finish the day. Why do you not need to be a religious leader to be guilty of the kind of hypocrisy that Jesus so soundly condemns here? How can we learn to see any such hypocrisy in ourselves, if it exists, and how can we get rid of it? Thursday, July 15. Uprooting Restlessness. Question. Read John 14, 1-6. In the midst of our own restlessness, what can we do so that our hearts will not feel troubled? What is the key to overcoming division, selfishness, ambition, hypocrisy, and truly finding rest? John 14, beginning at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Overcoming restlessness always begins with Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He knows the right direction when we wander aimlessly in the wilderness of our media-saturated world. As the divine lawgiver, he himself is the personified truth, and his spirit will guide us into all truth, as we read in John 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. When we are hurt, tired, worn out, sick and discouraged, he is the life. Not just any life. In fact, he has promised us life in abundance in John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. This includes our eternal home and eternal life, but it also entails a different quality of life here. The Creator surely is able to give abundantly and beyond measure, even now. Let not your heart be troubled is an invitation to live in anticipation. When we feel low, He is able to put us on a higher plane. When we struggle with darkness and sin, He is the one who not only began, but also will finish his good work in us, as we related in Philippians 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. No matter how bad things get here, and yes, they can get bad. Look at the promise we have been given in Jesus. He is preparing a place for us, a place where our pain, restlessness and suffering will forever be banished. That is the hope we have been given in Christ Jesus, and it is offered to all of us, no matter who we are, no matter our background, and no matter how sordid our lives have been or are now. The key, however, is for us to come to God anyway in our weakness, in our hurt, in our brokenness, and in our general fallen state, knowing that He accepts us despite these things. That is what grace is all about, and why we must believe that we have been given it if we seek for it in faith. Question. Read Jeremiah 3.22. What does God ask us to do, and then... What will he do for us 
in response. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Indeed, we do come to you, for you are the Lord our God. And so to finish today, think about Jesus' words, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, in John 14 verse 3. What should this tell us about how central and crucial the promise of the second coming is? Especially for us as Adventists, with our understanding of death, why is the promise of the second coming so precious? Friday, July 16. From the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 67 and 68, we read, There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centred in self. If you have accepted Christ as a personal saviour, you are to forget yourself and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ. Tell of his goodness. Do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart, and by every means in your power, seek to save the lost. As you receive receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labour for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the spirit will ripen in your character, your faith will increase, your convictions deepen, your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble and holy. End of quote. In dealing with issues between church members, we read in Early Writings, page 119, conversation has been protracted for hours between the parties concerned, and not only has their time been wasted, but the servants of God are held to listen to them when the hearts of both parties are unsubdued by grace. If pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would remove most difficulties. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. In class, think about practical ways of overcoming selfishness. How can you keep each other accountable so that these ideas can become a reality? 2. Ambitions are not inherently bad, yet how can we anticipate and imagine great things from God without falling into the trap of being consumed by ambition? 3. Most of us don't show ambition, hypocrisy, selfishness or envy on the outside. We are very capable of offering a more benign facade. Like the huge root system of the aspen tree, however, all these negative characteristics lurk below the surface. What does spirit-guided character transformation look like in practice? How can we overcome the root of restlessness and find true rest in Christ? And four... Dwell more on your answer to Thursday's final question about the importance of the second coming. After all, without it, what hope do we have? Without it, what good would Christ's first coming have done for us, knowing that the dead sleep until the resurrection, which happens only at the second coming? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Mystery Bible and it's by Andrew McChesney. A COVID-19 lockdown left Sandil Kumalo on his knees in South Africa's biggest city, Johannesburg. The national lockdown, among the most stringent in the world, shuttered the three churches where Sandil serves as pastor in the city of 5.5 million people. Tough regulations closed parks and banned jogging, dog walking and even the sale of cigarettes and alcohol. 
Like many pastors, Sandil moved his ministry online and live-streamed sermons to members in his three churches, Johannesburg Central, Johannesburg CBD and Johannesburg Inner City. Sometimes he received encouraging messages from people inspired by his preaching. But he longed to do more. He earnestly prayed to God to send an unbeliever who needed to meet Jesus during the pandemic. What happened next surprised him. One day, Sandil received a WhatsApp text message from an unfamiliar number. The sender introduced himself as Hilton and sent a photo of a Bible that he had found in a minivan taxi while travelling to work. Minivan taxis, which carry multiple passengers, are a common sight in Johannesburg. I picked up your Bible in the taxi, Hilton wrote. He explained that he had opened the Bible and, finding Sandil's name and contact information inside the cover, decided to write. Sandil looked at the photo with interest. He owned several Bibles, but did not recognise the one in the photo. The Bible looked new, and its burgundy red leather cover indicated that it was not cheap. Furthermore, Sandil had not written in a minivan taxi in years. He checked with his wife and other family members and they confirmed that he had never owned such a Bible. Hilton was not bothered that Sandil did not recognise the Bible. He was more interested in finding out what the Bible said. He had never read a Bible and he was eager to start. He asked Sandil whether he would be willing to help him read it. He wanted Bible studies. Sandil knew at that moment that God had heard his prayers for an unbeliever who needed to meet Jesus during the pandemic. God had answered his prayers in a miraculous way. I praise God for this unique opportunity for ministry of which I still cannot make sense, Sandil said. I hope our interactions will lead to Hilton accepting Jesus Christ as his personal saviour. And there's a photograph here of the Bible. This story illustrates a key component of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan, demonstrable increase in total members and congregations in all urban areas of one million people or more. Learn more about the strategic plan at IWillGo2020.org. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.